Greetings, everyone. Once again, Laszlo Montgomery here with another episode of the China History Podcast. We're coming your way via ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. Wherever you found me on the World Wide Web, I thank you for downloading and listening. Our little Dynasty Overview series continues today with the successor to the Southern and Northern Dynasties, the Sui Dynasty of the Yang family. We finally made it past the 271 years of disunity in China. Since the fall of the Western Jin, when the Sima Emperor and nobility were kicked out of Luoyang in 311, it's been one long, tedious, and confusing period in China with a lot of these small kingdoms and short-lived dynasties north and south of the Yangtze. It's been hard to keep all the names, dates, events, and places straight. Well, today we have a nice, clean, neat, and easy dynasty to review and get acquainted with, or, or reacquainted with, whatever the case may be. Today we look at the Sui Dynasty of 581 to 618. If you do the math, you'll see this wasn't a very long-lasting dynasty, not even lasting 40 years. Only two emperors reigned, the founder and his son, and then it was over for the Sui. These two emperors, Wen Di and Yang Di, really get a bad rap, especially the son, Yang Di, who ranks right up there with King Jie of Xia and Emperor Zhou Xin of Shang, whose infamy you might recall from earlier podcasts. The two Sui emperors, well, they tried to do too much too soon, and this was their undoing. But despite their failures and their personal infamy, the Sui dynasty actually did a few good things and pretty much dug the foundation and laid the groundwork for the Tang dynasty that followed. The Sui emperors did a lot of the heavy lifting that the Tang dynasty sort of inherited and walked right into. Some of these legacies of the Sui benefited the Tang dynasty immensely. So if you recall from the last podcast, the northern dynasties were the Wei that later split into two. Then you had the Qi and the Zhou, and it was the northern Zhou was... They were the last ones to fall, and it was the Northern Zhou that we had our hero, the very capable official, palace insider, and general Yang Jin. Yang, in 581, usurps the throne from his own daughter's son, the Northern Zhou Emperor, and then declares himself emperor in the beginning of the Sui Dynasty. Though considered a kind and gentle man and an extremely devout Buddhist, Yang Qian went ahead and immediately killed the 59 princes that survived the now vanquished northern Zhou. Once Yang Qian had them out of the way, he quickly consolidated his power and then went down to the south and made fast work of the surviving Chen dynasty with their weak emperor Chen Shubao down in their southern capital of Jiankang. And once the Chen falls in 589... That's the end of the last southern dynasty and the end of the uh, Nanbei Chao period. And finally, after 271 years, you have a China that is unified under a single emperor. Yang Jian begins his reign as Emperor Sui Wendi. Sui Wendi was not an educated man, but he was known as an effective administrator who wasn't above micromanaging even the most mundane issues. He didn't suffer fools or corrupt officials gladly. After a rather unstable period in China, Wen Di restored order to society and to the government. His methods were questionable, and he kept a lot of the harsh measures of the past to restore and maintain order, especially the methods used by the Northern Wei Dynasty. This didn't win him any admirers, especially in his later years when he was lashing out at everybody. As I just mentioned, he was a big-time Buddhist, and he made it clear, staking his claim for legitimacy, that he ended the northern Zhou for the sake of protecting the Buddhist faith from these northern barbarians. So during his rather short time on the throne, 4,000 monasteries, nunneries, and pagodas were built. In addition to this, on his orders, he left behind over 100,000 carved Buddhist images, and he called for restoration of hundreds and hundreds of thousands more images of Buddha that were destroyed or desecrated during the northern Zhou. Just as Liu Bang during the Han Dynasty used Confucianism as the common force to bind the country together, Sui Wen Di used Buddhism and Taoism as his great unifying forces in the north and south of China. These were schools of thought and ways of organizing society and living life that was appealing to the people of both the north and south of China. Buddhism permeated every layer of society, 
most notably in the imperial court, where many monks were appointed to positions of authority in the palace. You had this whole layer of imperial Buddhists who were very influential and quite a force to contend with from time to time. No separation of church and state in Sui, China, that's for certain. The first Sui emperor had to contend with the usual northern tribes who were giving the usual pressure. Although years of intermarrying and mixing of the two cultures had been going on, they were still enemies. The Sui emperors used the same old tried-and-true Chinese tricks that their predecessors tried to keep these Turkic and Mongol hordes at bay. This involved strengthening fortifications, marriage diplomacy, investiture of their leaders, trade and tribute missions, and most of all playing one tribe off against another and always trying to create discord amongst these rival tribes. Emperor Wen built his capital in Chang'an, which he renamed uh, Da Xincheng, uh, or Great Prosperity. When the new capital was finished, it was five miles wide by six miles long, or 30 square miles in total area. And Chang'an never looked better. So what else was going on in the world during the Sui period? It was the early Middle Ages in Europe, and there was a great famine going on in Gaul. Pope Gregory the Great was on the papal throne, and the prophet Muhammad was in the early years of establishing Islam in Arabia. It was the time when Jerusalem fell to the last pre-Islamic Persian Sassanid Empire. The Kaaba was finished in Mecca. The Justinian dynasty was ruling in Byzantium. Spain had just become Catholic. The Saxons were ruling in Britain, and you had the classical Mayan period going on in the New World, not yet discovered by the great explorers of Europe and Asia. So what can we say about the Sui? What were the great achievements during this short 37-year dynasty? There were a few, and all were very important. And as I mentioned, all the good things accomplished by the Sui were very important for the Tang Dynasty, which is coming up next. First and foremost, the Sui brought order and unity after two and three-quarter centuries of uh, historical volatility. Perhaps the most famous achievement of the Sui, and as important as it was famous, was the construction of the Grand Canal. The Da Yunhe, during the time of Sui Wen Di, he called for the construction of a canal that would link the Yellow River in the north with the Yangtze River in the south. For 1,550 miles, or 2,500 kilometers, the canal flowed, with connecting lakes and rivers, you know, wherever possible. The excavation took place between 605 and 611, which was in the, during the time of the second uh, emperor, and it ran northwest from Hangzhou to the Yellow River at Luoyang. An extension was also added to the north-south main route that ran from Luoyang to where around Beijing stands today. It was hands down the, the greatest civil engineering feat of its time. And when it opened in 611, the Grand Canal became this extremely effective waterway that linked North and South China. And with the Yangtze flowing east and west, and China was opened up like never before in all directions, North and South and East and West, and the newly unified China received great benefit from this canal. The Tang rulers were, were the real beneficiaries, though. The Grand Canal is still around today, and it's still used as a waterway to move a lot of cargo around China. There's this plan in the works, a massive infrastructural project like you see China do, one after the other, where they're planning to divert floodwaters from the Yangtze up through the Grand Canal to the northerly parts of China that is low on clean water but high on population. Well, you can imagine how huge the impact was on China when this Grand Canal opened in 611. This was still pre-motorized history. The motor still had more than 1,200 years to go yet. So in pre-motorized society, the logistics involved in moving bulk freight was, it was extremely prohibitive. Unless you were on a great river, there were huge constraints on the development of any semblance of a local economy. So when this canal opened up, it was like after the Transcontinental Railroad or the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System was, uh, was built in the U.S. Now anyone could just get up and go wherever they wanted and move tons and tons of freight and create tens and tens of thousands of jobs that lived off the shipping and distribution business that exploded after 611. The ripple effect of the Grand Canal's impact on trade and on the movement of goods and people through the 
emerging Chinese economy what was massive. Not only was it an efficient way to move large amounts of rice from the south to the north when grain was scarce, it was also a perfect artery to move troops quickly to wherever there was some kind of serious disturbance. It was also used by Yang Di as a, as a means to inspect the empire. The cities of Hangzhou, Suzhou, Yangzhou, and, and the vinegar capital of China, Zhenjiang, all grew into great cities thanks to their proximity to the Grand Canal. In these days, coinage was not as prevalent as in earlier days, and paper money had yet to be invented. Therefore, taxes were paid to the central imperial government in, in the form of grain or rice, silk, and other commodities. And the biggest users of the canal were, were government vessels moving taxes and tribute. Wen Di kept a lot of the good parts of the northern dynasties, especially what the northern Wei yielded to posterity. One of the first things Sui Wen Di did that was of immense benefit to the Tang was the promulgation of a legal code of 500 articles. This new legal code had both northern and southern sensibilities to it. He also began to refortify and enhance the Great Wall, even though its effectiveness wasn't any better than the Maginot Line of some 1,400 years later. Nonetheless, both emperors Wen Di and Yang Di went to great expense and rounded up enough laborers using all the means at their disposal. They spent the next few decades on the Great Wall Project. When the Tang took over in 618, they set to hell with it, and they didn't waste any time or money on it, and the Great Wall fell into disrepair and downright began to wear away with time. Even if it just slowed down the ever-invading steppe people, that was good enough for the Sui emperors. The Sui and Tang founders were actually the progeny of all the generations of mixed marriages that had been going on between all these various uh, Wuhu uh, barbarian tribes like the Mongols, Manchus, Xiongnu, Qiang peoples, and a lot of these Sinicized steppe people from the north and west and these Han who intermarried with them made up the Chinese aristocracy, mostly you know, up in the Shanxi region. Once Wen Di had unified China, he did away with all the prefectures from the southern and northern dynasties that were controlled by the local elites there. Instead, he had his own people installed as the local mandarins there, and they were all thoroughly vetted back in the capital, like back in the Han dynasty, and they had to jump through all the necessary hoops to pass the imperial civil service exams, and these officials, all Confucian scholars, were sent down to the various localities and carried out their government work. The central government didn't want any of these officials staying too long in one place, and they moved them around constantly. If they dug in for a long appointment, in no time at all, the local elites would be cozying up to these officials and using all their corrupting ways to get them to see things their way. So the system worked, and it allowed the central government to reassert control in the outlying areas. And other than the Hongzhi Emperor of the Ming Dynasty, who reigned 1487-1505, this uh, Sui Dynasty founding Emperor Wen Di, he had the fewest concubines of all the emperors of China. He only had two, plus his empress uh, Wen Xian. The Sui Wen Emperor died in 604 under nefarious circumstances, of course. It was... One of those things where maybe he was murdered, maybe not. He was a simple and frugal leader who, history says, cared deeply for the common people. His son, who took over in 604 and reigned till the end, came 14 years later, was not so frugal. Sui Yang Di has gone down in Chinese history as not only one of the most villainous emperors, but Surely one of the most profligate. The Grand Canal was built during his reign, as was this enhanced section of the Great Wall, and his pleasure palaces and over-the-top extravagances earned him no praise from his overtaxed and overworked subjects. It was said that when he opened up the Grand Canal in 611, Sui Yang Di led a flotilla of vessels, one more sumptuous than the next, and they snaked down the canal a hundred kilometers long. And as bad as all this was, and besides these signature projects, there were, there were a myriad of other smaller-scale infrastructural projects going on that just tapped the treasury. One good thing that surely saved a lot of blood and treasure was the state of geopolitics between all the Turkic and Mongol tribes. 
Fortunately for Yang Di, when he came to power in 604, they were so busy fighting amongst themselves, he had a lot of breathing room as far as they were concerned. This temperamental and mentally unstable Emperor Yang just loved pomp and ceremony and splendor. I mean, having this magnificent 30-square-mile capital of Chang'an just wasn't enough, and he commanded a second palace be built at Luoyang. He took Luoyang to new heights of luxury and made it the most splendiferous palace on earth. Adjacent to the palace, he built a, a park, 120 kilometers in circumference, that contained a nine-kilometer lake with three islands in the middle adorned with all these pavilions, and along the banks near these islands were a collection of 16 villas for all his favorites and cronies. And For a night out on the town, Yang Di would take his barge out on the lake and you know, hold these parties and fill the vessel with all these beautiful ladies and musicians. And If all this wasn't enough to already break the back of the economy, Sui Yang Di bet the farm on three military expeditions to Korea in 612, 613, and the most disastrous one of all against Koguryo in 614 and the subsequent retreat. The first expedition to Korea called for a total of 1,132,800 men. All three expeditions cost a fortune. All three failed miserably with massive loss of life and materia. For these defeats, Yang Di is, he's sometimes referred to as the Chinese Xerxes, alluding to the ancient Persian king's humiliating and utter defeat against the Greeks in 480 BC. So total was the defeat of Sui Yang Di, and so apparent was it to everyone who could read the signs that this emperor had definitely lost the mandate of heaven. After the last failure in Korea, Sui Yang Di, like Sulla and Tiberius before him in the West, retired from the throne and lived out his days in his third capital down in Jiangdu, or present-day Yangzhou. With this vacuum of power on the throne, things began to fall apart in no time at all, and you had a lot of problems with some of these generals maneuvering for the dominant position to fill the void left by Yang Di. There, in April of 618, he was strangled to death by a member of his own guard who dispatched the emperor only after murdering the emperor's favorite son right before his eyes. And that was it. No more Sui dynasty. Now, does Yang Di belong in the same breath with uh, Xia Jie and Shang Zhoushin, the two infamous kings of ancient China? Maybe not. He had quite a bit of good that offset all the bad. He's credited with the Grand Canal and furthering the power and control of the central authority. When the Tang took over from the fallen Yang Di, basically, they were handed a sophisticated political, economic, legal, and military machine, not to mention a unified China. The, the pump was primed by the two Sui emperors, and when the Tang began their road to glory, they received a very formidable head start. On the death and destruction front, when Di, and especially Yang Di, have a lot of blood on their hands, as far as the death and misery caused by their laborious construction projects and military campaigns. It was this, in fact, that led to a general revolt of the populace. It finally got so bad that the people just rose up. And amidst this chaos that started around 613, the end was coming for the Sui, and all it was going to take was one of these military generals to emerge victorious and declare an end to the dynasty. And it was General Li Yuan who seized power and established the Tang Dynasty on June 18th, 618. Li Yuan's mother, by the way, and the Sui Emperor Yang's mother were sisters. We're going to take a look at uh, Li Yuan next week and see how he and his son, the great uh, Li Shermin, swept to power and how Li Shermin, in his role as the Taizong Emperor, brought the Tang to a height of glory that is still talked about today. I think this will be a good place to stop right here. We'll save the founding of the Tang for next week. I imagine we'll look at Gaozu and Taizong only, and then we'll finish off in either one or two more episodes. We'll see how it goes. I thank you all once again for all your kind and encouraging emails. I'm really glad to see the list of listeners in China growing like it is. So until next time, this is your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, 
wishing everyone a fond and fabulous farewell from the town of Claremont, California. Yes, home of that very renowned, pricey, and reputable institution, the Claremont Colleges. We'll see you next week for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.